Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and Brian Murphy joins the show for the first time since the end of the season. And we agreed at the end of the year, Murph, that when there was a quarterback decision, you would be back. You would be running kids to hockey practice, living that dad life. Uh, But now uh, we need your context, your commentary. You wrote a brilliant article at purpleinsider.com. People should go and check that out about Kirk Cousins exiting stage left to the Atlanta Falcons, where he will be able to buy the largest house in the entire state of Georgia five times. Um, So good for him. He got his money. That's, uh, you know, what he was looking for is what the dollars represented. And the dollars represented that the Atlanta Falcons were really into Kirk Cousins more than the Minnesota Vikings. So give me your reaction first to Cousins leaving the Vikings signing Sam Darnold. And then I want to dive into a little bit of reflection with you about Cousins time in Minnesota and how we're going to think of it long-term because things have been coming fast and furious so much over the last two days that we haven't pulled back and said, wait a minute, what just happened here? What just transpired with Kirk Cousins leaving? So your reaction to his decision and where the Vikings stand now? I mean, it really was the the Atlanta Falcons and owner Arthur Blank really made it an easy decision for Cousins and an even easier decision uh, for Kwesi Adolfo Mensa and the, the entire Vikings regime, because not only was it, you know, 180 million, 100 million guaranteed, which was about 10 over some of the numbers that we had seen bandied about, but it was the four years. Uh, the Vikings were in no position to be handing a 30, soon to be 36 year old coming off an Achilles, already had a very underwhelming, productive, but underwhelming ultimately six year reign here. Uh, to give him four years. I mean, they're not going to pay a quarterback until he's 40. Now, the Falcons may not either, but that is a possibility. And it seemed like that, you know, the chatter at the Combine, just even with their coaching change, there seemed to be a sense that the Falcons are one quarterback away from really making a run in the sort of decidedly weak NFC South. And that's the beauty of free agency. Supply, demand, premium talent or premium position. You know, uh, once Russell Wilson moved on, uh, it, it was clear, you know, that the, the Vikings, Cousins was the number one name on the free agency board. And it seemed obvious, even when he was talking to the media after the season, as much as he wanted everyone to say that it's not about the money, it's about the value. But it's really about the money because the money is the value and the money is how you're measured in value in this cutthroat league. Uh the fact that the that there was going to be at least one, if not more, teams that were going to overpay put the Vikings in a really difficult position of, are you going to roll this back even riskier with more guaranteed money that you know you need to spend elsewhere, which they've done rapidly? Um, it wasn't surprising at all. And I think, it, you know, it's beneficial for Cousins. You know, again, the, the king of leverage, uh, you know, struck his major deal as his agent, Mike McCartney. I mean... Kudos to them for playing the long game and playing it well, and kudos for the Vikings for not taking the bait and and really falling into the trap of of chasing, throwing good man, money after potentially bad. So I think it's win win, uh, ultimately an unfulfilling tenure. Uh, but you know now you've now Quasi and o, O'Connell basically have their opportunity to make their mark. They inherited Cousins from the previous regime kind of stapled everything together the last couple of years, but now they get a chance to uh, to mold either Sam Darnold, uh, Don, <clears throat> Donald into the, the next stopgap. I think, I don't even know if bridge is the right word, maybe stopgap, uh, but all eyes are going to be on that number 11 pick and whether they decide to move up and, and all the shenanigans that are going to take place between one and 11 that are going to dictate which arm the Vikings are very likely to take and how much they're willing to spend to guarantee that they get their man. I have become a little tired of the bridge quarterback phrasing. And so maybe I need to use every different show, a different terminology for what Sam Darnold is. He's a guy. He's a, that's right. He's a, he is a a big hole in the wall. You just filled it up, but you, you know, the the rest of the house, it doesn't match very well. 
brilliant. Sp- this the spackle quarterback Sam Darnold uh, is now uh, you know the guy, but uh, only until maybe late April, and then we'll see what happens. But you know, I think that there is a question that will reverberate to our skulls for a very long time when it comes to Kirk Cousins, which is why didn't they win? with Kirk Cousins. And this to me is the legacy. The legacy could be, Hey, everyone thought he was a pretty nice guy. Everybody respected how hard he worked and how tough he was, especially after Netflix went behind the scenes and showed you how tough it is to be an NFL quarterback, how much dedication goes into it, that there was an appreciation for Kirk that grew uh, under Kevin O'Connell, that grew after the 2022 season. And yet you still walked away from that. And I remember saying to you after they lost to the Giants, hey, Murph, was that season worth it? And you said, no. I mean, you lost in the first round of the playoffs. It wasn't worth it. And that is something that I think for a long time in the future, we will be looking back at and going, was it as simple as just he couldn't get it done because he wasn't quite good enough? But how did he put up all those numbers? But how did he keep them in all those close games? How did he win 13 in a season where he had all those comebacks? Was it this was it that like how how did he not win with a team that had so much talent through the years i think that is a major part of what his legacy is defined by is someone could have such good statistics and so many tremendous performances and just not get them to where they desired to go when they signed him in 2018 I mean, the apologists have their laundry list of uh, reasons, right? Uh, excuses slash reasons slash reality. I mean, you can go through, you can go through them all. A lack of a running game at a certain time, suspect offensive line, porous defense, Mike Zimmer, a head coach that barely tolerated him, cycling through offensive coordinators. Uh, I, I at a certain point, you know, he's he he has to own his record now. He finally has an over five hundred record for his career, which. Uh, the 2022 season certainly did a lot to, to increase that, but I look at one and two and one and two is your playoff record. And, uh, you know, yes, he did drive them down the field, uh, in overtime to hit, uh, you know, Kyle Rudolph in new Orleans. And that was a fantastic signature aha kind of moment. But I think you wrote about this too. And, you know, six, seven days later, you know, 170 yards against arguably a great defense, but that's what you follow up with. And, You know, to have the Giants here, uh, a decidedly inferior opponent who happened to catch lightning a few times, just like the Vikings uh, in that 2022 season. But if you allow Daniel Jones to come into U.S. Bank Stadium and cut through the skull chant and all the expectations and, you know, that that enduring image of, of Cousins checking it down on fourth down in the waning waning seconds. I mean, those are the things that stand out is that. He didn't deliver when he needed to deliver. Now, intangibly, there may be may have been other factors. I mean, the Vikings defense was really suspect in 2022. We know that. Uh, but what separates and what defines Hall of Famers and what separates the greats in the game uh, is rising to the occasion when it matters most. Uh, getting it done in the postseason, getting it done, getting to a Super Bowl, getting it done in a Super Bowl, getting it done in the final two minutes of a playoff game getting it done when you need a victory for home field advantage. He had many of those moments throughout that 2022 season. I mean, the the Colts comeback is is something he'll remember, and I think fans here should cherish for the rest of their lives. Um, But ultimately, 10, 20 years from now, you're not probably going to measure him by that. You're going to measure him by one and two. Now, he still has a chance to to redefine that legacy in Atlanta. could make the argument he never really had the horses in Washington – He did have the horses here, but for, fill in any blank you want, what's he going to do in Atlanta? Um, It would be the ultimate slap in the face for him to go into Atlanta and sometime in the next two to three years come away with the Super Bowl championship, crowning that franchise, which has never won one, after leaving the one that has been starving for not only an appearance, but just a championship altogether. He's not done defining himself, but I think, you know, we're going to have to ultimately look at Cousins as only two playoff appearances in six seasons, only one playoff victory. And uh, boy, the Vikings paid an awful lot of money for that. 
The way that I look at Cousins' tenure is that you can break it up into three sections. 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Call them the COVID years, if you will. And then 2022 and 2023. So if we go back to 2018 and 2019, that is where I look at it as if Kirk Cousins had different circumstances then and was the quarterback that he became over the subsequent years where I think he improved. And especially when uh, Kevin O'Connell leaned into him, uh, then I, I think that that superimposed quarterback from the start of 2023 or late in 2022, if you took that guy back in time and placed him in 2018 and you placed him with an offensive coordinator who knew what he was doing and got along with the head coach and you placed him with a head coach that bought into him and said, he's our guy rather than trying to mind F him in OTAs and mini camp, which Mike Zimmer did. I, I remember that in, I think it was mini camp where he started throwing things defensively at Kirk cousins, where he was not ready for it. And they had a horrible practice. Guys were yelling at each other. They were upset. And it was like, what are we doing? Zim trying to prove a point that Kirk cousins was overpaid. Like what, what, what did you, what are you trying to accomplish when cousins hadn't learned the offense yet? And that defense had been together for several years. So of course you were going to destroy cousins before even training camp. And that set the tone for the entire 2018 season. And I think I'll remember 2018 and 19 for its drama and for its fragility, where those teams just felt like they were super strong and they were super talented, yet they were always teetering on total disaster. If Cousins didn't play well, it was, look at this guy who was overpaid. He, he got too much money. He's not our real leader. Teddy Bridgewater is our real leader, as you know, Mike Zimmer certainly thought throughout that time. And then Zimmer seemed to do everything he could to kind of troll Cousins along the way. Even when they played Teddy Bridgewater later on for Carolina, it was, oh man, we love Teddy. He's a playmaker. He's a great leader. Wink, wink. Oh, there's something in my eye. Oh no, actually I'm taking shots at Kirk. Like, come on, Zim. Like, is that really necessary uh, that he could never let it go? And then he picked the wrong offensive coordinator. Had Zimmer in 2018 been able to retain Pat Shermer and they ran the same exact offense, that was really built off of play action. I think that would have had a lot of success, but they brought in the quarterback coach from Philadelphia and asked cousins to run something that he had never run before. So if there's a big giant steaming regret season, I think it's that 2018 year. And that set the tone for the entire rest of time that he was here. I, I don't think it can be overstated how much of an indictment. I think cousins haphazard performance really was on the previous regime of Rick Spielman and Mike Zimmer. I mean, you brought up a lot and you were out there. I wasn't out there as much uh, in those years as I had been before covering the team, but even just reading and, and, and sort of gleaning just the attitude. And just, as you mentioned, it was sort of a relentless, uh, almost big brother, little brother bullying where it, 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 it got uncomfortable and it got, and it, and it was counterproductive. Look, you may have lost a power struggle with Rick Spielman. You may have told him, look, this is not a guy I want, not a guy I can work with. I don't believe he's a winner. Look at his 500 record. But at the end of the day, you're the head coach of an NFL team and your fate, like it or not, is going to be spot welded to that of your quarterback. As much as Zimmer was a defensive guru who wanted to to play in his own sandbox and build a, a top-notch defense and just run the ball like it's 1985 and don't throw picks and stay out of my way, Mr. Quarterback, Mr. Multi-million dollar overpaid quarterback. That kind of toxic relationship, especially when it's played out publicly the way it, it did year after year, game after game, kind of disappointment after disappointment. I mean, look, I mean, Cousins is a human being. I mean, I, I wouldn't want my boss undermining me behind closed doors, out in the public, and sort of not really accepting the fact that I've been hired to do this job. We're in this together. Uh, we probably can accomplish more if you're not constantly undermining me like that. So look, it's the it's it's it's, it's complicated when you when you talk about the Zimmer and Spielman regimes. Uh, it's it's easy to say, uh, 
Cousins may have been poisoned and damaged because of that. But I think there's some truth to that. And I think I think that also permeates the locker room. Um, I'm, it, it, it kind of fed into the fan base's notion that this is just sort of, oh, jolly, gee, aw, shucks kind of guy that that really just sucked up a lot of great stats on a bad Washington team, you know, played his cards right as he has every time at the negotiating table and really just never fit in in those early years as somebody to rally around. There was the COVID. I'm not going to get vaccinated. I'm going to build plastic shields around my table in training camp that proved to be an un unnecessary distraction, not about his choice, but about what it means to be the leader and the highly paid leader of an organization that the majority of which uh, went along and got vaccinated. I don't want to pick too many scabs there, but it all is part and parcel of the perception of cousins, the treatment of cousins, the production of cousins. It should be no surprise that once Zimmer was gone and Kevin O'Connell came in, that cousins had the best season he had in Minnesota with 13 victories and was on pace to probably have the best season of his career last year before blowing out his Achilles uh, in late October at Lambeau. Um, so you bring up a good point. I, I I hadn't thought about it as much, but he really, really did not get the smooth on-ramping that he should have gotten that he probably would have under this regime five or six years ago. So I do. I want to get to 2020 and 2021 because I think it is important to break this down by these sections because so much was different from each like two year span. And we'll get to the COVID thing because it is really relevant uh, to part of his legacy here as the Vikings quarterback. So, uh, but in 2018, 2019, I think of it like this, the environment that Mike Zimmer created. Imagine that you and the wife get woke up in the middle of the night and then the next day you're just bickering all day and you go like, why are we bickering? Oh yeah, because we're both just in a bad mood. And why is that? Like, why is there this tension here? Because we're in a bad mood and his contract, I think, and Zimmer's disposition toward him created that bad mood from the really very beginning with Kirk Cousins. Now, Cousins' response to that was also not good enough because I remember, and I was standing right there in 2018 when they went out, they played the Rams. Cousins played great, but they lost it in a shootout where Jared Goff had a perfect quarterback rating. And then he gets strip sacked at the end of the game. And a reporter asks him the most simple question. So what happened on that last play? And Kirk says, I don't know, you tell me. Like there was a defensiveness to him where he kind of sensed this. Oh, you guys think I got overpaid. You guys think I'm not good enough. Zimmer doesn't like me. My teammates don't like me. And he didn't handle that the way that he would have several years later, I think. Uh, I, I think that the contract, the attention that it drew, the environment that was created caused a tension in Cousins and a defensiveness in Cousins that did not allow him to really uh, ingratiate himself to the team. And then you see by the end of the season, when they ran into some tough times, they fire their offensive coordinator. All they need to do is beat the Chicago bears and he and Adam Thielen can't get on the same page and they're yelling at each other. And I just thought, you know, in, in life in general, it all comes down from the top. What you have at the top, it dictates how everybody else feels. And we have seen that from Kevin O'Connell, like that team, even though they went seven and 10 last year, there was no give up. They were close in games that they lost at the end of the season. The players were still buying in. Uh, we did, we didn't see a melting uh, like we did under Mike Zimmer. And I think that cousins could have better put some of that aside. He could have better tried to establish himself as a leader, and I think that he would have, if he could do it again, probably go back to that team in the early days. And rather than saying, well, this is kind of someone else's team, which he said out loud, by the way, this is Harrison Smith's team. It's Eric Kendrick's team. It's Everson Griffin's team. It's like, no, man, when you're the quarterback and you just got 84 million guaranteed, which at the time used to be a lot, uh, then you are the leader. You are the franchise face. And he would talk like he wasn't. And I don't think that went over particularly well either. You had a bunch of guys who were the toughest, 
the, the most hard nosed, the guys who had just come off a winning season. And it was somebody coming in saying, I'm just here to sort of work here. And that did not as a vibe go over very well. And then Murph, you know, the 2019 season, the whole training camp was tense. They come out of the gate. They have the thing with digs happen. But I, I thought what you saw there was under Kevin Stefanski and Gary Kubiak under the right system and guidance there that they put up a very good season. They outscored their opponents by whatever, a hundred points. They, they had the best chance in 2019. And when they went to San Francisco and he threw for 170 yards, that's when they should have known that this wasn't going to work because they overcame the drama. They came back in that season. They made the playoffs. They won that game in new Orleans, despite all the things that were going on, including rumors that Mike Zimmer could be traded to the Dallas Cowboys. And they put it all aside and Kirk played a hell of a football game. Isn't that the day Ziggy Wolf came out with a statement on the day of the game? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's yes. Because I, that, Yep. I think pro football talk had put it out there. And of course, if you have to put out the statement, then it's probably a real thing, but he, he goes into the Superdome beats Drew Brees, beats the new Orleans saints, leads the game winning drive. And you go, there it is. I mean that what a performance. And then the following week is 170 yards and they are down by like 17 points in the fourth. And he's checking down to CJ ham or whatever. And you just go, I I don't know how this is ever going to work. And I think Murph, If it had been cut off there, if they had just said, you know what, that's it. Like, let's just draft a quarterback next year and let's just put an end to this experiment, move on from Zimmer, move on from Cousins, revamp the roster. We went all in. It didn't work. I think we'd be talking about a very different history after that, but it was that playoff game that caused them to think that they were close when they weren't. Uh, because of where it was going to go cap wise in the future. And it was there that they should have just parted ways and said, we tried, but they didn't. And it took four more years to figure out that that wasn't ever going to come back. The team that they had and the quality of team from 2019. I don't know any, what you're saying rings true. And and in retrospect is perfect pragmatism. I don't know any owner GM front office that makes that decision and admits that kind of a mistake in that moment. Um, They're going to attempt to fix it. They're going to attempt to uh, make do with what they have because of the financial commitment, the political commitment, the, the, it would have been a wholesale regime change. Now, if they do lose that game in new Orleans, maybe the plug is pulled on the regime, not certain about the quarterback, but certainly on the regime. Again, if the if the Wilfs are putting out a statement the morning of a playoff game to tamp down rumors that uh, their head coach is on the move, uh, that probably means there was a kernel of truth to that. So the fact that he ends up uh, countering that, Cousins ends up countering that narrative and countering that potential franchise-shifting moment with arguably, well, his only playoff victory and one of his big clutch moments, his only clutch moments really in a postseason game, it is ironic because it didn't serve him any good a week later and it hasn't served him any good four years later. And I think too, it's, 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 I, you know, there was a lot of image scrubbing with the network Netflix series. Um, you know, the Kirk O'Chains, the, uh, the sort of softening of Kirk, the, 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 the humbling and, and a little bit more of the connecting with the fan base uh, was so late in the game. I don't know. And, and a lot of it proved calculated. I, we know it was calculated in a lot of ways to lead up to this moment, building up his profile, building up his bona fides, showing the rest of the NFL that he is a pretty good guy. He's productive, but he's a good guy. He's a guy you want in your locker room. I don't know where that PR campaign was or should have been in 2018, 2019. Uh, maybe he just wasn't comfortable in his own skin doing that yet. Uh, it's kind of a shame that, you know, as soon as he went down with his injury, you know, there was a lot of uh, skeptics remorse, I think, in some, not skeptics remorse, but there were a lot of people by October that saw what he was doing on the field, knew about his durability, watched the Netflix series, understood what he did to stay on the field during that 13 win season in 2022. It really did humanize him. Now, I don't look at Kirk Cousins as this uh, metamorphosis of a human being. I mean, let's face it, he's a He's a negotiating shark uh, who's played his leverage to the hilt. 
Uh, you could say he's a bit of a wolf, wolf in sheep's clothing when it comes to his persona. Uh, but it's just ironic that just as he was probably winning over the most fans that he probably will ever get here is the moment he leaves. The moment he gets hurt and the moment now he leaves. Um, look, it was very tribal, you know, everybody's opinions on Cousins. You were in one camp or the other, and those camps varied in size depending on performance or anything that came out of his mouth at, a, at various times. But his popularity in this market was had, had peaked, and uh, as soon as it peaked, he's gone. Now, the lessons he may have learned in terms of leadership and how he presents himself to a team – uh, his, you know, accepting the responsibility and the, uh, the role that, uh, his contract and his status as a starting quarterback, who's not just starting games for Washington, but who was brought into a market and to elevate that, that team into a Super Bowl champion first here. And now Atlanta, he may be able to handle that a lot better, but you're right. He certainly wasn't prepared in 2018, 2019 for the resistance he got at the top, the sort of indifference of the fan base. And I think really, I, I don't think he was prepared to be the alpha male when the money and the role said you are the alpha male. Oh, that's right. And then in 2020, he signs another very expensive extension. They lose a ton of talent. And that was where the roster conversation began because in 2018 and 2019, they had the rosters to win. They just didn't do it. If, you know, Patrick Mahomes had the 2019 Vikings. He cruises to a Super Bowl. They were a really, really good roster that year. Okay, there's a hole at left guard, but I mean, come on. The rest of the group, they were healthy on defense. The receivers were phenomenal. Like they had everything they needed. Uh, even Irv Smith had his moments in, in 2019. They were a deep team. It's the last year that they actually blew teams out. That They were very good. And Kevin Stefanski is now a two-time coach of the year that was your offensive coordinator. That's when they had everything. But Stefanski gets the head coaching job. Gary Kubiak, I think, was still really good as an offensive coordinator. Their numbers were good, but he was still on the older side. And I think that maybe the NFL had seen some of Gary's stuff so often that they were prepared for it. But more than anything, it was just that the roster was not going to be good enough to prop up a quarterback that's just okay. And so they would get into these close games and Kirk would put up really good statistics and they would lose because their defense wasn't good enough because they were trying to play Jeff Gladney and Cam Dantzler and Holton Hill maybe and all these kind of random young players on defense to take the spots of great <laughs> players from before and it just didn't work in 2020. They weren't a good enough football team. And that's where I will say it was not Kirk's fault at that point. It was the front office's fault for extending him and putting him on a team that they couldn't win with. And then they set up the contract to be at its most expensive in 2021, where in an ideal world, they would have had one dip year and then come back on the other side. But they were so restricted in 2021. As soon as they had a couple of injuries, once again, we went right back to, yeah, you're just an in the hunt team at best. And and as far as the COVID thing goes, two things that are really important in 2020, if he was going to establish himself as a leader, that was impossible. It was impossible for anybody to lead in 2020 where you couldn't even be close to your teammates at any point. Uh, that was just an impossible year for the entire league. And then 2021, and we don't have to get into who's right, who's wrong, whatever else. But when it comes to that Zimmer, Kirk Cousins, tense relationship that was always teetering on explosion. All of Zimmer's frustration came out with that cousin's decision. And then the public explanation and the press conference and all those things. And when 98% of the league was doing it, and then one guy says, no, I'm not. And Zimmer knew we're probably going to be on the cusp of a playoffs. And if we miss that one game from our quarterback, because well, he may have been frustrated by Kirk. He also understood he was way better than Sean Mannion or Kellen Mond, and they were going to miss the playoffs. And then Mike Zimmer's worst nightmare 
came to fruition where he had to miss that game in Green Bay. And that's where that night in Green Bay, it totally ended because Zimmer just went nuclear on Kellen Mond for no reason whatsoever. And that was where the circus had to end between those two. So you can talk about uh, what, you know, his choice or whatever else, that's something that you can discuss at home with your family. But when it comes to its relevance to his time here, it's a big deal because that season they were a good team and they did bounce back to some extent and they had a chance, but they lost like every close game that year to start the season. And there was this just palpable tension between those two. And that was where Spielman and Zimmer's relationship drifted apart. And it just, it truly became a, a zoo out there at TCO Performance Center. And that was the, the tipping point where he came out and said, Jake Browning's smart, he's vaccinated. He came out and talked about how mad he was that Kirk missed that practice. And it just set a tone for the rest of the time there that was never going to recover. And then I think, once that was gone, once the COVID conversation was gone, once the tension was gone from Zimmer, Kevin O'Connell got to play the good cop. He got to come in and say, Kirk, I love you. Let's the, like, you're my guy. I came here for you, buddy. And one, I remember this Murph, you probably heard me say it, lean into the Kirk. I said it many times, just throw the ball, just lean into Kirk. And I think what Kevin O'Connell proved was leaning into his weirdness as a guy, lead, leading into the kind of dad vibe, leaning into him as a unique type of leader, uh, and also just telling the whole team, this is our guy, okay? Follow him. Do what he says. Kevin O'Connell would bring him up in front of the team and make him speak to the team. Do you remember when Linval Joseph once forced him to do a breakdown of the huddle in Chicago because Everson Griffin wasn't there? Like you had to be forced to do it in 2018. But in 2022, O'Connell said, hey, come on in, be this guy, lead this team. And I thought in that case over the last two years, he proved that he could do it, which just shows you the importance of the relationship between the head coach and the quarterback, I think. Oh, it's imperative. And then when we, you know, when we, when Zimmer was fired, we, we come to find out he hadn't talked to Spielman in months, which is just, that's dereliction to duty on both of their parts. They both deserve to get fired. If you're not speaking to your head coach, uh, as the game, as, as the season, you know, they were both, you know, Spielman was managing for his job. Zimmer was coaching for his job and they couldn't see eye to eye. And it, you saw all the comments uh, both on the record, off the record from a lot of people on that team, a lot of leaders on that team, a lot of defensive leaders. You know, Eric Hendricks comes out and says it was a fear-based organization. Uh, that toxicity, you can't help but infect every player and, and impact uh, respect, leadership, roles. I mean, just think about anybody out there that you, you know, most, most of us work for somebody. We either work for a company, a corporation, uh, a facility, uh, and you work for a human being who is directly above you, and that person also works for a human being directly above them. If there is no communication or a lack thereof, or there's animosity or disrespect or just downright, you know, hatred, uh, there's no th nothing that's going to work. You cannot function as any kind of organization if you're not cohesive. So I think, you know, with O'Connell, you know, you're the reason I came here. Yeah, I'm sure that's what he had to say. He came there because he wanted an NFL uh, head coaching job. He inherited a quarterback that he could do some things with and mold. But I think O'Connell's role in the last two seasons with Cousins, as much as it was unleashing him maybe offensively, it was probably psychological as well. Uh, you got somebody who's a little bit closer to his peer age. Uh, he played the position. Uh, he knows what it's like to fail. Uh, he knows what it's like to sort of feel the pocket collapsing around you and and sort of that that sense of being the man in the huddle. He could relate to that. He could also relate to the fact that Kirk had been bullied. He had been beaten down. And as much as, you know, he may not have always believed that, and again, I'm getting deep into the psychological weeds here, but O'Connell knew that in order for him to succeed as a young, unproven head coach, he needed to maximize his quarterback. And as you said, they schemed it up, they turned him loose. And I think he, if anything, he, he allowed cousins to play freer because he wasn't afraid of failure. And that's a huge thing, even for 
elite athletes in their mid thirties, uh, to always feel like you're being judged or you could, it could all fall apart or you lose it all on one throw, one poor throw. Look, there are consequences to this job. It's a cutthroat business. We get it, but it's also nice to know that your boss, your immediate supervisor is there for you and is going to allow you to fail so you can get better and come back the next time and learn from your mistakes. I mean, Zimmer just barely tolerated uh, Cousins and could barely tolerate anything the offense was doing that didn't either control the ball, control the clock, or make life easier for his defense. O'Connell came in with a little more of a holistic approach, and I think he deserves credit for that because, look, he was able to coax uh, 13 wins plus what, four four more this season under under Cousins? I mean, I think, what was he, 17? You know the record, 17 and 8? or something like that under O'Connell. I mean, there's no reason to believe that the Vikings wouldn't have. They were on pace. They had started out slow, obviously, 0-3, 1-4, but they had managed to get back to 500. Cousins was as confident and productive as he's ever been. What would he have done in those bigger games in November and December? We'll never know. Uh, but I think it was obvious the Vikings seemed to be on track for 9 or 10 wins. I don't know what that would have set them up for because they were set up for more success with 13 victories in a home game against the Giants in 2022. But again, just like everything with the Vikings, what might have been? I mean, there's so many what ifs. Uh, it, how could this have played out? It might, it it was not going to end in confetti, confetti in Vegas. We know that. Um, I don't know what kind of uh, future Cousins would have had had he finished the season here. The numbers might have just been impossible to make work regardless. Um, but I do think it, I think O'Connell gives, gets a lot of credit for inheriting a quarterback who is, you know, psychologically beat down and transforming him and, and unleashing him uh, to at least what we've seen as his full potential. And I think Cousins embraced the role and that freedom allowed him to be a little bit more lean in. You talk about lean into the Kirk, how about lean into the dork? I mean, that's kind of the image he embraced, you know, I'm just, you know, a cheesy white dude from West rural Western Minnesota or Michigan um, I don't know what to do with all this money and fame and this whole like alpha male thing. So I'm just going to let people throw chains on me and dance around, you know, the, the old man at the wedding kind of thing. And that endeared himself to people. And I think people were thirsting for that kind of a, an opportunity to embrace some, but you know, you want to in a town uh, feel like you're, you know, one-on-one -on -one with your or lockstep with your starting quarterback, as I was saying, it's just kind of ironic that as that seemed to be hitting on all cylinders, that's when his Achilles popped and uh, we'll never see him in purple again. So it's so interesting and there's so many layers to it and there's so many relationships and circumstances, salary caps and decisions and draft picks. If the cornerback draft picks turn out, if the next Daniil draft picks turn into the next Daniil, are we talking something different? If there's a left guard anywhere on God's green earth who could have blocked for Kirk, is it a little bit different? But you know what? Ultimately, at the end of the day, I will think of this Murph is that all that stuff we just talked about, great quarterbacks overcome it. They make sure. people. They are not made, they make, right? That's what great quarterbacks do. And he was never good enough. He was never great enough. And that was just always the reality in Washington, and it was here, and it probably will be in Atlanta too, is you're just not good enough to overcome a coach that doesn't love you. You're not good enough to overcome a left guard who can't block for you. You're not good enough to overcome a fourth and eight play where Dexter Lawrence breaks through the line. So you check it down because you can't run away and you don't have a strong enough arm to throw off balance deep down the field to Justin Jefferson, the physical tools at some point became relevant every single season that when Josh Allen needs to win a game, when CJ Stroud needs to win a game, when Patrick Mahomes needs to win a game or John Elway or Dan Marino or Jim Kelly or Joe Montana or wh whatever number of great quarterbacks you look at, there's always a playmaking or physical element to those great quarterbacks that Kirk Cousins simply did not have. And so the Vikings at the end of the day, put all of their eggs and all of their dollars in the basket of someone who didn't have the skills to take them to a championship and was too expensive 
to make up for those weaknesses. And I, and that's how I'll remember it is that they just kept doubling down and doubling down on someone who is not simply just not good enough. And this is, it, you know what it's like? It's like having Donovan Mitchell as your best player in the NBA. Donovan Mitchell's wonderful. He's not LeBron James. He, he's just not. He's not Kevin Durant. He's not Steph Curry. You had Donovan Mitchell. You didn't have Steph Curry. And so you had someone who needed to be made, not someone who will make. And you ultimately end up with a lot of seasons that just came up short, which I want you to leave me with this now, Murph. Because, no, Dan, I know Dan Marino didn't win a Super Bowl, folks. Was Dan Marino good? He was in a, what, my gosh. Uh, why do we do this? Uh, Dan Marino is like the greatest quarterback ever when he retired, okay? So anyway, I got to do these history lessons for people. It's like it's like I should hold a, a Hey, he was in a Super Bowl, and he only lost to Joe Montana, the greatest quarterback of his generation. I know. And the AFC championship in 1994 and was a seven time all pro and is in the hall of fame and is just one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. But anyway, the whole point just being that Dan Marino had the arm, he had the size, he had the, the gift he had that the Kirk cousins never had. Right. And it, and a lot of it is simply physical. And, but also some of it is emotional. It is it was, he is, was he as cool as Joe Montana? Was he as, as confident as him? Was he as gutsy? Was it like, no, and the answer is obviously just no. Was he willing to take risks in the way that Matthew Stafford even did or have the arm talent? No, he's just missing key elements that all the great quarterbacks ever have. That is the point. So anyway, again, someday I'll do a live stream where we just do education on football history and we go through the quarterbacks and so forth, but that's not tonight. The Vikings are now Murph faced with a huge decision at quarterback. Sam Darnold is clearly not the future answer. He is the spackle quarterback. Love that. Uh, but also the doors have been swung open and the fresh air has hit Vikings fans in the face and, and, uh, of possibility. And I guess I, I'd love your opinion on what they have to do next to make this work in ways that it did not over the last six years? Well, clearly they have to draft their franchise quarterback, which is no easy task. We know how that is as much of a crapshoot as anything in, in pro sports is drafting a guy that you can rely on for 10 or 15 years in the pocket. That just doesn't happen often now. And they're sitting at 11. What they can't allow is other teams to outmaneuver them on draft night. What they can't do is if they have their sights set on one of the half dozen blue chip prospects that everybody's been talking about. If somebody swoops in and undercuts them, are they going to be desperate and just grab the next name? Uh, are they going to, do they have a trade contingency that might be in place uh, either that night for a pick to cut in front of the line on somebody or to uh, circle back and make sure that they're not standing there with their pants down at number 11. So this is where Quasi is going to earn his money. He's already made the decision that was the practical overdue decision, writing sort of the wrong that the previous regime uh, had committed. Well, now you got to make your bones because this is going, this decision you're going to make on April 25th and the maneuverings you're going to make or anticipate or defend against or, or outmaneuver are going to, it's going to be what defines his legacy. And he's got some splaining to do. Uh, for his pretty thin drafts and, you know, trading down and, you know, he, draft day has not been quasi strong as suit. I think maybe roster management, he's been able to plug some holes with some, some cast offs and, and, you know, some players that may have been overlooked, but now you've got your, your gold brick in your hand. What are you going to do with it? So I, I I'm going to be curious as those quarterback names tick off, and as those teams that we think are eyeing those quarterbacks start making moves and getting aggressive, how is he going to respond in real time? That's really going to be this. Frankly, I, I, I'm usually not all that excited about draft night. I'm going to be really intrigued to see how they how they maneuver or how they protect their flank, um, because I'm sure they'd rather be inside 10 than outside 10 right now. And sitting at 11, I mean, I think Atlanta's still sitting at eight, right? I mean, they could. They could double dip on the Vikings if they really wanted to be shrewd about it. So, 
you know, what are the Bears going to do? Uh, there's just there's so much that's going to happen between picks one and 11, so much that's going to happen in real time on that Thursday night. And they're going to have to read and react, and they're going to have to have a plan B, C, and D. That's not just a, well, you know, we saved face. I mean, you ideally want to be drafting somebody that could start in 2024. If they can't, that's fine. You have Sam Donald to kind of bring him along and maybe fight and scratch for eight or nine wins. But if you end up with a guy that uh, is is not was not on your second or third pick, then that's where I think the front office is going to get judged harshly. So I, I'd, I'd love to see how they're going to manage all the intrigue that's going to play out before they even get to pick. Look at you loving the draft now. Look at you, a cynical old reporter man. Now is pumped about the draft. Murph, it's all about the games. Done. Don't it's, nobody wins the off season. No. <laughs> uh murph uh, your article is uh wonderful at purpleinsider.com go there check it out subscribe to the newsletter get uh, my articles every day and uh really appreciate you doing this man i'm gonna hang around on the live stream answer a handful of questions this is my fourth podcast today so probably not gonna go for the next two hours uh but I, i'll answer some questions now but just thanks for coming on man yeah. and uh stopping by and breaking down the legacy and the next time we talk on a podcast it's going to be entirely about the Vikings future and what happens. And uh, I think you're going to go to the draft. I, I am think. a bunch of buddies decided that are all out of town are going to all fly in back to our hometown of Detroit and go to this party in Detroit because suddenly Detroit seems to be the epicenter of the NFL world. So uh, yeah, I'm going to be part of that whole uh, dog and pony show, but also I'm going to be really intrigued to hear what the Vikings do. And boy, if they were to take JJ McCarthy and I'm not saying they should or will, uh, Detroit's going to erupt. So it should be a pretty cool scene down there. I'll try to chronicle that as well. Uh, definitely. So we'll, we'll, if we don't talk before then, then we'll definitely talk uh, after that. So thanks again, Murph. Everyone go check out his article and uh, we'll talk again soon, man. Appreciate you stopping by. All right. Thanks everyone. Oh, let me make me full screen now. There's big me, uh, Brian Murphy, the best uh, at talking about things like that now. So as I mentioned, uh, I've been up since seven o'clock because the Vikings decided overnight to get Sam Darnold and then bring in Aaron Jones. So I shot out of bed, ran downstairs, knocked over my camera and did a live stream. So make sure you go check that one out. I look terrible uh, in that live stream, but I still blasted out blazing hot takes on Sam Darnold and on Aaron Jones. So go back and look at that one after this, but I've got enough energy for like five questions. So fire your best and uh, I'll answer a few more. And then I, I still got to write some stuff for tomorrow. So give me, give me your best couple of questions here to uh, wrap up the stream. Uh, <laughs> this does not count as one, but I laughed about this. JP, when does cousins trademark you like that <laughs> expire <laughs> yesterday? I think yesterday. Uh, this also does not count. Who's my favorite guitarist? Uh, once you guys found out I play music, uh, you went nuts about the guitars. But I will answer that. Randy Rhodes, Ozzy Osbourne guitar player, uh, inspired me to shred. So I would say him. Uh, this comes from Tony. What are your favorite defensive tackles or corners in the draft or still left in free agency? So let me, I, I could take a look at this as far as free agency. I really like the. Um, Legereus Sneed idea. I know that's a trade. Uh, as far as the draft, so Quinion, Quinion Mitchell would be one. I think he's probably going to be a first rounder. Um, as far as defensive tackles go, Byron Murphy is the guy, uh, but also Braden Fisk from Florida State. That's a name I'm going to bring up a bunch of times as someone who could be available in the second round. So I'm trying to find a remaining free agents list and over the cap is not loading uh for me uh, all that well so uh, someone's gonna have to give me the remaining free agent cornerbacks i have not looked at that i was looking at more of the draft for them in corners or in a trade but uh that could be a position that they put a little more money into and sheldon rankins is a guy i've brought up a bunch of times but uh eric armstead from the 49ers getting cut should be still a potential option for the vikings to look at if uh, they feel like they can push some of that money down into the future. But if you've got potential corners or defensive tackles 
uh, that you think in free agency the Vikings should get, drop them into the um, drop them into the comment section here for me. Give me a little help on that. Uh, Cade says, "What will it take to get to number three? It might not be possible." And you've heard the rumor that the Vikings wanted to go up and get Anthony Richardson last year. And I imagine they were calling up and saying, can we give you two first rounders in a second? Can we give you three? And I, the answer was no, because the Indianapolis Colts were going to take their guy with the number four overall pick. And they did. And also the Texans wanted to trade up, take Will Anderson. It just didn't work out. And with the way that the top three are laid out with three teams that desperately need quarterbacks, Unless they really don't like Jaden Daniels or Drake May, I just have a tough time thinking that those teams can afford to trade out of really good quarterback prospects. If one of them was willing to do so, I'm just going to keep saying three first because I, I think with the amount of competition to trade up, nothing short of that would do. And I mean, you have to consider that there's other teams behind them that want to trade up as well. The New York Giants could be looking to trade up. So there's going to be so much shuffling and competition for that, that it's, it really probably is three first round draft picks, that same price for Trey Lance to kind of set that future market. But if they did that, I'm, I'm good with it. I am totally in to three first round draft picks. I know it makes life difficult. But when you can give the supporting cast already to that quarterback, you can find these other signings. We've seen them. They signed guys in their mid-20s who are quality players. If you've got the money in the cap space, then you can make up the difference from not having those draft picks. Will it eventually hurt you down the road at some point? Probably. But in a short term, in a four-year window on a rookie quarterback contract, you can definitely acquire those players from other places, including trades. So I'm okay with it. If they decided to go all in, I just am not sure they would have that chance to do so. Uh, Thor says, how does Sam Darnold stack up against this quarterback class? Well, the difficult part about that question is that we already know the answer on Sam Darnold, which is that he hasn't worked out as a prospect. If you said, where would he be drafted as a prospect? He was really highly regarded. But I don't know that he would top these top three. Uh, I don't know that he would be a better prospect. He wouldn't be a better prospect than Caleb Williams because Caleb Williams is up there in that other echelon of the Trevor Lawrence, the Andrew Luck sort of. I think everyone's below Peyton Manning for prospect, but he's in that right underneath Peyton Manning as far as how he's been talked about by the NFL as a franchise quarterback. He could bust, but that's just the way he's been discussed for two years. Drake May and Sam Darnold may have similar quality where it's tools you're looking at a little bit more than some of the mistakes in the tape. May doesn't turn the ball over nearly as much as Darnold did and is, I think, a more uh, you know playmaking type of quarterback, can run more than Darnold. So he'd be a little, I think, a shade ahead. And I'm only going off of what I remember as, as Darnold is a prospect from 2018. And I think, you know, Jaden Daniels in 2018, and that's the funny thing about how the league changes in 2018, Jaden Daniels would be like, not a good prospect. The, the NFL, as we saw that year from Lamar Jackson, they would have said second rounder. The guy is the next, who was it that was taken? Who is the running quarterback who was taken in the second round? Pat white. He's the next Pat white, you know, and so forth. But now the league has changed and it's changed its mentality toward quarterbacks instead of, Hey, you got to come play our system. We're going to shape our system to you running quarterbacks succeed all the time. We've seen it with Lamar. We've seen it with Jalen hurts and it just looks at it differently. So if he was in that draft, he's probably a second rounder. And instead uh, he's going to go number three overall, maybe probably likely. Uh, uh, so I think that the three from this year, are all better prospects in the context of right now than Sam Darnold was, but having already known the answers to the test, we know that Darnold's flaws are pretty fatal when it comes to turning the ball over, not processing quick enough, not getting the ball to the right places and having wild bouts with inaccuracy, interceptions, sacks, all that stuff that that has really uh, hurt his career and his ability to be a franchise quarterback. If you can smooth some of that out, then you know maybe you've got something there, and that's what 
Kevin O'Connell and Josh McCown are going to try to do, but um, you'd much rather pick what's behind door number two than Sam Darnold. If you're saying, would I rather bet on Sam Darnold changing his DNA over the next three years versus Michael Penix becoming a good quarterback? I'd rather go with Michael Penix. But one thing we know is uh, you never really know. Uh, AS says, uh, love Harrison Smith, but when do you think he's getting restructured or cut? I think they need an answer from Harrison Smith at some point on whether he's going to retire. Uh, that's number one. Uh, they can't really move forward with some stuff cap wise until they have that answer. But also, you know, these deals, they're agreed upon and then you can make them official at a different point in time. So you sign Aaron Jones doesn't have to become official official. Uh, I think until tomorrow, right? Is that how that works? Where when the league starts, that's when, so you agree to terms, but eh, you can maybe wait a little bit to get an answer from Harrison Smith. And if Harrison is not retiring, then the restructure will come very shortly after that because last year he was willing to take a significant pay cut. So if he's going to stick around, then he's going to do it again. So it should be uh, coming soon, I guess an answer on that. And I've been leaning a tad toward retires, but yeah, you know, maybe he's excited by this, this, uh, new thing. I know that he said that about Flores last year, where he kind of got excited to come back and see how it played out. Uh, Ken says, what are Kirk stands afraid of losing? <laughs> uh, I, I can't put myself in, in a lot of those people's shoes and I don't pay much attention to them. Uh, one thing that's great about the purple insider audience is how reasonable most people are. So if there's unreasonable opinions about Kirk cousins or anything else, I just ignore them. So I'm not, I'm not too concerned about that, but to your point, I mean, you could ask this about Kevin O'Connell. What was he afraid of losing? Kirk cousins is very good and you can plug into uh, you know, your offense into Kirk cousins and he's going to run it and he's going to score points and he's going to move the football and he's going to be accurate. And there's charts out there for everything. But one of them shows, you know, when Kirk has a clean pocket and he's got an open receiver that he delivers with accuracy as high of a rate as anybody in the NFL, it's just that football's not perfect, right? The, the, the clean pockets, the wide open receivers, it might be three out of five plays, but in the other two, you just lose uh, with Kirk Cousins, whereas with Allen or Mahomes, you can still win those downs. Uh, Bulldog 13 TV, Broncos are the most dangerous team to the Vikings QB plan. Sean Payton desperate to prove he's still a guy and has to take a swing after Wilson. I agree that, you know, Las Vegas, you could see them taking a little more of a mentality to... Well, you know, I don't know. Las Vegas does go crazy sometimes. Look at their owner. He just hires and fires people left and right. So they, I think they're up there too for threats. I think the biggest threat that's now emerged is really um, the New York Giants because they are right there in position to take J.J. McCarthy. So you have to get past them and you have to get past what they'd be willing to trade up in order to... You know, take J.J. McCarthy. It seems. It seems. I'm going to put that qualifier on everything. It seems. Unless we're being smoke screened, which maybe we are, uh, by teams that want to be traded up with for J.J. McCarthy. But if that is the case, then the Vikings have to get over the Giants, whereas the Broncos are playing from behind. And that, you know, they might be playing a little bit from behind in draft capital after all they've given up to get Wilson and to get Sean Payton. So how, how can they really do that? Uh, or are they sold on somebody else? Like Sean Payton is a different cat. He may look at a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix and say, no, that I can work with that. That's my type of quarterback as opposed to needing JJ McCarthy. I'm not really sure. I, I mean, I think that Kevin O'Connell, if you got into his mind, McCarthy is the ideal type of quarterback. He's got the tools. You just develop them. You put them in the right spot. He's got the mind for it. He's a great communicator, which is going to be important for working with Kevin O'Connell. So there's a lot of things that match up there. Um, but yeah, I think I mean, you're right that Denver is a threat, but the Giants, if they're out entirely on Daniel Jones, are maybe the bigger threat because they're ahead. Uh, Kendall Fuller, that's a good name, is a free agent out there. If they're looking for like a one-year type of deal, uh, I, I would probably say that they should look for something a little more long-term. Let me see if I can find available free agents. It's bothering me that I wasn't able to answer that question with corners. 
Um, NFL free agents. I'll, I'll get the list up here for you, and we'll take a look at we'll take a look at corners. Does that show how much I love you guys? That I am bothered by the fact that I didn't get an immediate answer to that off the top of my head. Uh, let's see, free agent tracker. Okay, we'll take a look at this, and let me let me look at some other. Let's see, uh, positions, cornerback. Let's see who's out there still. I have been so wrapped up in Kirk and everything else that I haven't looked at this list. So I think uh, Kenny Moore just signed tonight, I think. Keyshawn Nixon uh, is an interesting one from the Packers that might be somebody they could work with. This list isn't great. It is not great. Adoree Jackson had a really bad year last year, but was good two years ago. Uh, I don't think there's much interest in bringing back Patrick Peterson. Steven Nelson is a quality veteran, but not really in love with him. And if my list isn't updated, I'm I'm sorry on that. I'm just looking at one of the latest, like who's available. It's not a great group. They may have to look at somebody who's kind of okay and maybe fits the system or somebody that, um, hey, Duke Shelley. Who wants Duke Shelley back? Somebody that Brian Flores likes, bring him in because the, the big fish are not that good. Uh, Brooks says, isn't the upside of Darnold totally being missed in all the hoopla? No, I mean, I think that's part of the conversation. It's always hard for me when, when people ask about like Kirk stands or what people are saying. It's like, I don't know what everyone is saying. I only follow like a thousand people on Twitter. Unlike my colleague, uh, Judd Zolged, who follows 15,000. So he knows what every person is saying in the whole world. But uh, I try to kind of, keep my eyes on the smart analysts in football rather than, you know, kind of the wild opinionists or, you know, people who do it performatively to get attention and stuff like that. Like, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. So I don't really know like what everyone is saying about Sam Darnold, but I think that is a key part of the discussion is that there is a real possibility that under these circumstances, he could be better than he's ever been. Now, what the actual upside is for a guy who's always been turnover prone, that I'm not sure. But not even being 27 years old yet, it's wild how long he's been around and he still isn't 27. But yeah, no, that's a big part of the discussion for sure. And it's one of the reasons, other than the fact that he's a quarter of the price of Kirk Cousins, uh, but it's one of the reasons to like the move is that if he becomes just a backup, great, that's fine. Work with the young guy, can play if you need him to. But there's always, hey, could there possibly be a little bit more than that with Sam Darnold? If they had to play him for the full season, could we find out that there's a little more Geno Smith there, a little more Ryan Tannehill than we thought? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that that's a possibility. And why in comparison to a Jacoby Brissett, for example, I like it more because he gives you a lot of the same experience of being around the league and working as a backup before with sort of an intrigue. I mean, hey, training camp, it becomes really interesting. Who wants to go? If we've got Sam Darnold versus Michael Penix every day in a quarterback competition, I'm I'm interested. If it was Gardner Minshew, I'd be like, okay, well, it's not really a competition. But this one, it actually could be. Uh, Vic ND says, what's the probability that the Vikings nail the quarterback in this draft, get their franchise quarterback for the next 12 years? Okay, well... 12 years. I, I don't know how many quarterbacks become good in the next 12 years. Here's what you're looking to do. Here's the minimum is Baker Mayfield, Carson Wentz. Like look at these quarterbacks, Jared Goff with the Los Angeles Rams. Look at those quarterbacks. And I think all of you, when I say Carson Wentz, you'd be like, huh? Carson Wentz. He didn't, he's not a hall of famer. He's not a, he's not even really around anymore but they succeeded with Carson Wentz. The point isn't exactly to draft your 12 year quarterback. If you do, then my gosh, what a golden ticket to being there every single year. But if you just draft a certain caliber of player is Brock Purdy, the 12 year quarterback of the 49ers. I don't know, but they were in a super bowl is Jalen hurts. The 12 year quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't know but they went to the Super Bowl and it turned out that Jared Goff was not the 12 year quarterback for the Los Angeles Rams. They went to a Super Bowl. So if you draft a certain caliber of quarterback, 
then it is a huge success. To your point, yeah, to draft a quarterback that is the quarterback for a dozen years, it probably is less than 20%, even in the first round. To draft a quarterback that gets you 12 wins in a season, and you go into a playoffs with a plus 100 point differential and a legitimate chance to compete for a Super Bowl. What's the probability of that? Well, that happens with maybe 40%, 50% of the picks. And what do we always tie together with that? Well, they had weapons. Well, they had a good coach. Well, they had a good roster. They had good circumstances around them. Even with Carson Wentz, as you saw, when the roster fell apart, then he fell apart. But early in his uh, tenure with the Eagles, they were great around him, and that's what helped him become the version of Carson Wentz that he was on an MVP track in 2017. So what we call a success is, can you draft somebody good enough? Baker Mayfield in Cleveland had an 11-win season, and they were a Chad Henney runaway from the AFC Championship. Like, if you draft a quarterback that gives you a chance to get there, then you've done as well or better than they just did for the last six years. And you're probably going to get multiple shots at it. Cleveland obviously was a tire fire, but you're presuming that that's not going to be you, that you're not going to name Freddie Kitchens your head coach or something. So uh, I, that that's kind of the point. You don't even need the best quarterback. You don't need him to be at the top 1%. You need him to be good enough. Uh, so that's, that's why you just take, I mean, that's the, the argument for just taking one. I'd prefer Kevin O'Connell get the guy that he really likes, but uh, that's the argument for just taking one. Rob says, uh, do you think most of their picks this year are going to be used to move up? It's just the way the board's going to fall on draft night. Do, do you guys know how awesome that draft night live stream? Oh, we're, we're going to be here. I got the TV set up right over here. That's how we're doing it. I, I could be out at TCO performance and I'd rather be here with you guys. So that's where I'm going to be on draft night as that thing plays out. How fascinating that's going to be because I, I don't think that they would use a lot of their draft capital this year. It would more likely be first rounders that opposing teams are going to want that could be trading up with. Uh, it's going to be, you know, the next three first rounders, maybe a second rounder, but this year that they only have that second round pick. And that's a really important one. We can't like, completely, you know, lose sight of that. Uh, reader from Cincinnati, as far as a uh, a potential defensive tackle, man, he got hurt against the Vikings. That guy was a beast. He was a beast. So yeah, I'd I'd like him paired with Harrison Phillips. They would really be able to stuff the run. Uh, Tony says, uh, I think there's an above fifty percent chance JJ McCarthy is our quarterback. I mean, if they came away with Sam Darnold and J.J. McCarthy to replace Kirk Cousins, is that not the one of the best possible outcomes outside of had they gotten the number one pick? That's got to be the best possible outcome, right? That they end up with that. If McCarthy really is a cut above these other prospects, if they end up with him and you've got him in the top 10, if you trade up, you get him in the top 10 and you've got your guy to build around, you've got the circumstances, the situation, the the former quarterbacks who are going to be working with them. You can't ask for much more than that if that's what they end up with. If that's what they end up with, extend Kwesi and Kevin O'Connell because that will have been the best possible offseason that they could have, in my opinion. The full execution of plan from start to this moment. And then give them time to let it play out. Don't panic after next year if they only win seven. Like give it time to build around him and let it play out. And then we'll have real expectations in 2025. But if that's how it worked out, uh, that would be absolutely ideal for the Vikings. Miles says, do we believe the bears are actually going to draft Caleb Williams? Yes, I do. I don't think there's any other outcome and always the qualifier that if I knew everything that was going to happen, then football would be boring. But man, if they passed up on Caleb Williams, they would be insane to pass up on a prospect of that caliber to stick with fields or, and you know, I guess may could be, that's the one thing I'd throw out there is that if their evaluation said may it, that would be pretty crazy. But I think, I think Williams is just a cut above and is in a different echelon of prospect than other people. And we got a little too caught up on what we had just seen for some USC losses and so forth. 
Chris asks, uh, should the Vikings trade up to three or four to draft JJ McCarthy just to block Sean Payton from drafting him? Uh, four would probably be the spot. I mean, three uh, is going to be, you know, likely uh, the Patriots taking a quarterback, but four is four and five are where you have to have your eyes on it. Uh, yes. Uh, out of spite to not let Sean Payton draft his guy. Uh, I know Vikings fans are not into Sean Payton for sure, but really just if they have to do that, it's because they think that JJ McCarthy has the, the actual ability to be a franchise quarterback. And that's the only reason that you would do it. Um, Brandon says our quarterback will fall to number 11, very possible that that could happen. And this is where you just, you really don't have a sense for it. Um, and I'm going to try to get a sense for it as we go forward. I plan on going to the owners meetings in Orlando in a couple of weeks where Kevin O'Connell is going to talk. He will not tell us who they're going to draft as they never, ever do, but we're going to try to get a feel for where they stand headed into the draft. And maybe, maybe there is a lot of this like smoke with JJ McCarthy because the NFL wants somebody else to pick him. I don't know. Like that was what happened with Will Levis and the Malik Willis and Will Levis drafts over the last two years. They just broke me when it came to believing that I know what's going to happen because I remember going into the, those drafts like, Oh yeah, this is exactly where those guys are going to go and super confident in the quarterback rankings and everything else. And then we just get blown out of the water right away. I remember talking about Malik Willis a ton. Oh, he'd be a great prospect for the Vikings to draft, develop for a year. And then it turns out he's not even a real prospect. So sometimes we get those things thrown, those wrenches thrown in our, in our, um, our beliefs uh, and going into the draft. And it is possible that if you're going to pick McCarthy, you have to make him your franchise guy. And maybe teams at the top won't believe that, or they won't believe Drake may is worth the number two overall pick. And that's just our thought, but not what's actually going on. So that's what makes it so interesting, but they could wait till 11. And then if you miss, then it's so much easier. If you pick a guy at 11 and then he gets in your building and you go, Oh no, like Kellen Mond right away. Oh no, this ain't going to work. Just not going to work. You drafted Kellum on the third round. It didn't hurt that much. You, if you draft Bo Nix at 11 and he gets in your building and you're like, oh no, it doesn't work. Well, that's one first round pick. They've had other first round picks go bust. They've got one at safety uh, at the moment. So you can survive it. You can go on to the next quarterback. But what you can't survive is trading three firsts and have the guy go bust. That's where you can't. Uh, so it, waiting at 11 is not the craziest thing I've ever heard. Seven dragons asks, are people just making up these stories about Justin Jefferson? I believe he's going nowhere. The Jefferson thing is odd. I was just watching. I don't like, I just don't like calling people out. I kind of like to call out industries and you can figure out who I'm talking about. Um, so I was watching a national reporter talk about Justin Jefferson and he talked for about three minutes and every single thing he said was wrong. Uh, and that's just, he said, this is why teams lock up stars after three years. No, they don't. No, they don't. They only lock up just uh, Josh Allen after three years. They only lock up quarterbacks after three years. There, there are very few, if any position players who have signed extensions after three years, even negotiating with Jefferson after three years was a total outlier. As you saw from the 49ers with Nick Bosa, Nick Bosa is the best player in the league at his position or whatever, number one, a B or C. And they extended him after the fourth year of his contract. So there was number one. And then there was, well, without Kirk cousins, I mean, he's going to want answers for who his quarterback is. Well, the draft is in April. They have until the beginning of the season to negotiate. So he will know who his quarterbacks are. The other thing is too, well, he loses his quarterback who pumped him the football. Is there a quarterback who's not going to pump him the football? Because I seem to recall Nick Mullins pumping him the football about he put up numbers with Nick Mullins that he rarely even put up with Kirk cousins. He's going to get the football, whether it's Sam Darnold or whether it's Bo Nix. And I don't think that if he's signing a four year contract extension, he plans to only play for the next year in Minnesota. That means he plans to play 
through the next several seasons as they build to try to win a Super Bowl. Now, at the end of that contract, then you might be in bad shape. And as far as the trade stuff goes, what could someone trade you right now for Justin Jefferson that would make it worth it? Three firsts is probably a no for me. So what? You take three players, you hope they add up to one great player at best. I mean, if you trade Jefferson to a team, they're going to win. So you get the 23rd overall pick, the 26th overall pick. Like we've done that dance. You know how hard that is to get stars. It just, none of it adds up. And what always happens with this is the player who's negotiating People try to, you know, do jersey swaps because they don't have a real hobby and they, you know, try to make something out of nothing and, and make it seem like, oh, something big could happen here, something big, because it's dramatic and it's exciting to talk about, but it's just not reality. And I will not believe it until I see it. And if it happens, then I'll say, you know what? I was completely wrong. I misread this one. They were trading Jefferson all along. But does that really sound realistic? Like, I don't know. When when we were talking about trading digs, it sounded realistic because he was on his second contract and very upset. But Justin Jefferson is the reason you're going to succeed in the future if you're the Vikings, not a guy that you're trying to move out from under. So all of it, I think, is just what happens when someone really important is negotiating a contract and they have to put reporters on TV and former football players on TV and they have to say words about it. And if they say these words, if they go, all right, we're going to go out to this very important reporter and he's going to tell us about Justin Jefferson. If he goes, guys, just wait till like late August, it'll be fine. Well, I mean, is that good television? Probably not. That's why you follow your local beat reporter. I mean, if we get past, if we get past September, uh, anxiety, but not until then, not until then. And for me, I'm going to be there, uh, you know, so I'll be here taking you through every step. Like it doesn't, it doesn't benefit me to tell you to freak out at all because we'll be there every step of the way with everything that happens. But as far as if you're trying to make a little noise, uh, as a reporter, as an analyst, whatever, it's much easier to do so by saying, you know, this Jefferson thing is pretty crazy. It's really not. This it, Every contract negotiation with every big player in the leagues work just like this. They don't work them out. Uh, uh, usually these extensions on the first day of free agency, they usually work them out before training camp or at some point in camp, just like with TJ Hawkinson. It's exactly what happened. And he became the highest paid tight end. So it's not a crazy comp for what's going to happen with Jefferson. So anyway, sorry to uh, rant about the football, uh, you know, landscape as far as analysis reporting, but you just are benefited so much more in media by saying, you know, this thing could go really bad. than you are by saying it's probably going to be fine. It's almost certainly going to be fine. They're going to negotiate a contract and he's going to be here. And that contract is not going to get expensive until like 2026. And when it happens, I'm going to pull it up on the screen and I'm going to read every freaking cap hit for you guys and how they can re renegotiate it every year. Just like Patrick Mahomes renegotiated the contract this year and how much more cap space they can spend and how it's not the end of the world. So I look forward to the day. We will have another really fun day when that happens. And again, if I'm wrong, then it is what it is. Uh, sometimes it, I am surprised by that. Uh, uh, big grilling dad says Darnold's a 60% completion percentage pastor, uh, completion percentage, really not a great statistic, but does anybody think that precision accuracy has been Darnold's thing? That's what you're looking to try to correct is decision-making and accuracy and consistency. With Darnold. And that's what you're hoping if you're the Vikings that he has spent the last couple of years really working on because players can get better. And uh, I don't know if he will or not, but he, but he can. And it has happened historically. Uh, loaded guitars says Dalton Reisner question mark. I see that Dalton Reisner is tweeting through it. Seems like there might not be a whole lot of interest in Dalton Reisner because why else would he be tweeting uh, about how there should be more interest in him? If you're the Vikings, you like Dalton Reisner as a pass protector. He's pretty good, but 
how much money do you want to give Dalton Rice? He's a pretty good player. I liked him. I, you know, as a pass protector, that's important. But you just brought in Aaron Jones. You really want to run the ball better. I think what you're probably looking at is maybe a competition between a couple of guys, and that might be a better way to go about it than just going with someone that we know can't uh, run block really at all. It was just such a problem as they went down the stretch last year. Uh, Big Grill and Dad follows up with uh, Bradbury had a 60.9, I assume you mean PFF grade, Ingram 59.5, and Reisner 57.1, which was largely because of the run blocking. His pass blocking was excellent. He didn't allow a single sack, but that's the problem. Uh, the whole interior offensive line needs to be replaced. That I, I think that like you can't likely replace the entire interior offensive line. Bradbury is a fine center. It When you go look at the league's centers, there's two or three difference makers and everybody else is Garrett Bradbury. He's not paid very much. It's going to be almost impossible to upgrade. That's fine. Competition at right and left guard, that's what they should have. Who's the best fit? Who plays the best in training camp? Give the job uh, to those guys. So uh, someone just says, uh, Seven Dragons just says, Sneed. That would be one heck of a move if they traded for Legere Sneed, for sure. For sure it would be. Uh, let's see. Brandon says, enjoy uh, Gr- uh, Grenard and Cashman. will uh, miss that. I assume you uh, must be a Texans fan. Thanks for Hunter. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the trade-off that the Vikings made because they knew that Hunter was going to get a bigger deal than they offered. So uh, I guess you're welcome. I had nothing to do with it. But, you know, Daniel Hunter, I'll miss as a locker room guy, uh, always a super friendly kind person who is very easy to talk to, which sounds crazy because he's six foot five and 265 pounds and all of it is muscle and his hands are like, he could clasp his hands around my entire head and then snap my head off and throw it through the goalposts without even blinking. He's that strong. And yet he was a very gentle person uh, when you're around him, very friendly, very nice. I wish him the best. Uh, uh, when they were doing locker clean out, I just said, Hey, like, thanks, man. I mean, this has just been a great biking career. So I appreciated his interactions with the media the entire time. Super, super uh, gentle, nice person. And I say gentle as in like welcoming, you know, like if you went up to Daniel Hunter, he'd say like, oh yeah, hi, what, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Kind of thing as a reporter. Not everyone's like that, but not gentle on the field. He will absolutely murder you. So uh, the dichotomy of Daniil, really, but a guy that I had just so much respect for. Oh, uh, Keyshawn Nixon re-signed with the Packers, huh? Okay. Stefan Gilmore is a little old for my taste. I thought he was okay last year, but not great. That's the thing. I was trying to look for uh, cornerbacks that I thought could be good for them, and I did not find all that many. So that might be a bit of uh, a problem. Cashman sounds stoked to go to the Vikings. Yeah, well, he should. I mean, coming home where uh, he played well for the Gophers. He was, uh, a you know, a, a fan favorite here. People really liked him. I think they were surprised when he was only drafted in the fifth round. Uh, Loaded Guitar says Vikings are going to go up and get Daniels or Drake May. I, I think that would be their preference. I really do think that they would like to trade up, but it's just, it's going to be hard, man. Um, And, you know, w- when we talk about guys, like, you know, in the comments, you're talking about Penix and his injuries and stuff. We, they're going to do medical evaluations on this stuff. Football players have injuries. They tear stuff. They have surgeries. Like it happens. Uh, and it, look, there are great quarterbacks in the league right now who are in their primes, who have gone through surgeries. It going, having an ACL tear doesn't mean your career is over. Uh, we've got really good medical science. So it really depends on how they think that it healed, what the long-term prospects of it are. And if his medicals went well at the combine, then he could have a chance to be like a late first round draft pick. So uh, I think he's got the talent and he's got the leadership to do that. Uh, But I don't know what his medicals are. And I think that when you jump to conclusions, oh, he's broken or whatever, it's like, this is the football though. Now, if he had certain injuries that looked like they were going to be recurring. Okay. Drew Brees played his whole career with a busted shoulder. I mean, I don't know. Didn't, <laughs> didn't Philip Rivers play a playoff game with no ACL like football, man, you're going to get hurt happens. 
Uh, Nick says, do you think that drafting a quarterback early buys Quasi Adapo Mensa and Kevin O'Connell more time? I don't know about buys them more time is, is the way that I would phrase it. I think that from the beginning, it appears that they all had an idea of how they were going to bring this thing around over the length of their contract. And then they were going to reassess at the end of the, or when the contract comes up of how they feel it's, it's going. So if the idea was always to get to this point, uh, to get to this point of drafting a quarterback, then they're going to assess how it looks when they get to here and drafted a quarterback. And does it look like it's going in the right direction by the end of this season? That was always going to be the case. Now, if they had brought back cousins. So yeah, I mean, I guess by a year, because you were always going to assess it, but if they brought back cousins, then you better make the playoffs. You better be in deep in the playoffs or you deserve to lose your job. And, uh, you know, that's not the feeling now. So yeah, I mean, I think only by a year though, because you're going to look at it by the end of 2024 and say, where do we stand? Are, are we in a position? This is how the Wilfs are going to ask themselves this. Are we in a position as the owners of the Minnesota Vikings to feel like our leadership group is taking us to a place we want to go? That's what they're going to ask. And if it looks like the answer is yes, they'll extend them. And if it looks like the answer is no, then they won't. And then things get really dicey, but they've put themselves in a spot where they could be. Uh, what about Bob says, why can't this team ever just dress defensive tackle or both guards? Well, one is the scarcity of those things. It's, it, look, there's just not that many of them. It, if a team has a great, I was actually surprised by Christian Wilkins. If a team has a great defensive tackle, I mean, they keep them. They pay him a butt ton of money and they just make sure that he's there forever. Defensive tackles are like the most likely guy to start and finish their career in the same spot. I don't like have analytics on that, but I'm just thinking of the Grady Jarrett's, the Kenny Clark's Akeem Hicks, I think spent a year in Tampa Bay, but Geno Atkins, you know, most of his career in Cincinnati. If you got that guy, you keep him for a long freaking time. Uh, Pat Williams, Kevin Williams, you don't let these guys get away until, you know, they're really old. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that's a, a reason. And there's just not many good guards. Look at the guards that got paid and their numbers. I mean, Dotson was a star, but there aren't too many others that are like that. I like this comparison. Aaron Jones, the new Chester Taylor. Underrated. Chester Taylor's underrated. Uh, I don't think this is true. Mateo says J.J. McCarthy is like Teddy when the only thing people talk about is his leadership and not his actual play. It's an issue. Was Teddy an issue? Uh, they won the division before he got hurt and he was on an upward trajectory. So I don't think that Teddy was a an, a, an issue. Uh, Teddy was, I don't know. The people are weird about Teddy. Why are people weird about Teddy? They had a great 2015 season that they needed a field goal to go through the posts. And then they're a dangerous team going forward after that. I don't know. People get weird about it, but uh, McCarthy has more physical skill than Teddy Bridgewater did. Uh, he's quicker. Uh, his arm is stronger for sure. His arm is stronger down the field. Accuracy, you know, down the field. Accuracy is, is going to be, have to be something he works on, but I think he's a better prospect coming out of college than Bridgewater. But also, you know, when you use that as sort of an insult, it's funny because if Teddy Bridgewater remains healthy and they build that team around him the way that they did by 2017, you got a chance to win the Super Bowl. So if JJ McCarthy becomes Teddy Bridgewater and three years into the guy's tenure, you are on the precipice of building a team that could compete for a Super Bowl. Man, give me that. Absolutely give me that. It's like because because Bridgewater wasn't. Although you look, everybody hates everybody. I, yeah, I bring up Dante Culpepper and someone will be like, he fumbled. And they're like, oh my gosh. Just, you know, that's just how it is with quarterbacks. Uh, Brandon says, what's the real story behind Lewis scene? What do you think the story is behind Lewis scene? That's what it is. It's not anything more complicated than what you think it is. What you think it is, is that they drafted a guy who was physically freakish in college and dominated because of it. And got to the NFL and just couldn't handle it. And uh, that's it. It's not a secret. It's not complicated. It's If you're going to play for Brian Flores, you have to identify a lot of stuff really quickly. It's a super fast mental game. And fit is really important for safeties and a defense. And uh, I think that it wasn't just... So you, you mentioned, you guys mentioned learning the playbook. I don't think it was just the playbook, but it's IDing 
things very quickly. Your mind has to work unbelievably fast if you are uh, a safety uh, because you have to identify route combinations. You have to understand where everybody else is on the field. You have to be able to come play in the box. You have to be able to drop back deep. You have to, you have to play the robber position where you start it too deep and then you come in over the middle and then you have to read crossing routes and you have to understand where the ball's going. There's just a lot happening there. And I don't think that he ever really grasped how to do that. And I think maybe just the mind didn't work that fast. And also when uh, Matt Daniels mentioned him showing up to meetings on time this year as an improvement, I thought, okay, well, that might uh, tell you something as well. <laughs> um, are you scared about what Tyler Eifert and Jamar Chase are tweeting out? Is there a JJ trade in the works? I mean, I saw... Tyler Eifert, like what, how long has it been since we've heard from Tyler Eifert? I have no idea. There has been no credible evidence that the Minnesota Vikings would trade Justin Jefferson. If he's traded, then we'll have a heck of a freaking emergency podcast. Anything can happen, but Tyler Eifert, like where is Tyler? He was amazing on Madden. If you, dude, if you have an 85 speed tight end on Madden, dominant. So shout out Tyler Eifert for helping me on Madden, but I don't know that like there's an inside source with Tyler Eifert or people are just playing on the internet. I, I have no idea. There's just no reason for me to think that they would trade Justin Jefferson. If they do, I will think it's nuts. Um, especially if you're going to draft a quarterback and hope he succeeds. Now, if they trade him for Jamar chase, then, uh, okay. I, that I might be interested in trade him for Jamar chase. But they're both going to be expensive and awesome. So I don't know. Uh, trade him for uh, now. If you got really wild and you traded him for T. Higgins and two firsts from Cincinnati, then maybe you could make that work. It's just that there aren't many realistic trades for Justin Jefferson. And if you trade him for T. Higgins and then you have to pay T. Higgins, then what was the point of doing it? Uh, Kyle says, uh, could you see us trade back, get two defensive tackles early, focus on the rest of the draft with car corner guard and wide receiver three on getting Shadur Sanders next year? You're just not drafted number one next year. This team is good. You don't go out and you don't get a Jonathan Grenard and Andrew Van Ginkle and Blake Cashman if you're going to tank, like it just, it's not happening. They're not tanking. Um, they're not getting Shadur Sanders as the number one overall pick next year, which he very likely will be. But to your question about trading back, if they thought that say, for example, let's say that Denver has already traded up and they've gotten JJ McCarthy, let's just say, and the Vikings want Penix, but they definitely don't want Michael Penix with the 11th pick they could move back and take him with the 18th pick or something and then try to pick up additional draft capital. So th that could be possibly in the cards. Okay. few more questions. I am uh, running a little low on energy and also I do have to still write some stuff. I know I, I said like five questions about 45 minutes ago, but you guys are just keep dropping great questions in the comments. So that is the trouble is that you guys are good at this. Uh, Jeff says, do you think the Vikings are willing to go with Darnold this year if their quarterback is not there? Instead, continue to build the roster for the future. That, to me, is a pretty tough scenario. And are they? Could they be? Yes. And, and if somebody goes nuts and gets McCarthy, they have no belief in Knicks or Penix, then that might be where they end up. I don't think that's a very happy draft night, though. If you walk away from... Now, if they end up in the third round and it's only four quarterbacks in the first, then I would change my tune and say, well, that's just how the cookie crumbled, but you needed a plan to go get that quarterback. You can't let somebody else go do it, not in this spot. And then to have them come out and say, oh, we've always believed in Sam Darnold. Well, a one-year, $10 million contract. I don't know about that. So, um, you know, I just, uh, I think that they need to try to make sure under any circumstance that they go out and uh, they they make sure that they uh, get their quarterback. So, um, you know, you guys with the Teddy Bridgewater stuff is just goofy to me. It's just, it's just goofy to me. He wasn't special. Look, nobody thinks that Teddy Bridgewater was Patrick Mahomes. That's not the point. And I, I don't know how many times we have to go over this with quarterbacks and what is a success. The success is not 
did you draft a guy who's big? The success is, were you in the Super Bowl? Were you in the NFC Championship? And nobody could tell me that the Vikings with Teddy Bridgewater were not headed on that trajectory because they ended up there with a far inferior quarterback in Case Keenum. Teddy Bridgewater, did you guys didn't even give him, those people who are making the determination on those first two years, you didn't even give him a chance to really develop into a, his third year. And go back historically, and I've done this, usually third, fourth year is where guys come into their own. And I think we all watched that preseason and saw that it was headed that direction. What was also emerging was Thielen and Diggs. He never got to play with Thielen and Diggs. He only got to play with an antiquated offense with Adrian Peterson, and they did really well as a team and won the division. Uh, I mean, any anything that's down on that situation is just bizarre to me. I mean, that was, that was you talk about like being in the right path, that's when they were in, in the best path they've been a long time. Can I do a live mock draft? I definitely will, but I will definitely not do that right now um, because at some point, uh, yeah, I know, I know. Look, look. This is this is a silly criticism of Teddy Bridgewater because their defense was great and they had Adrian Peterson. If you draft the quarterback and you build a team around him that's great and you have a great running back who helps you win, I am failing to see the problem with this quarterback if they are winning with the group. This is the Brock Purdy thing. People go nuts over like Brock Purdy's raw gifts or whatever. I don't care. I, I don't care if Teddy Bridgewater could throw it over the mountains or Brock Purdy either. He got his team to the Super Bowl. That's the goal here. Okay. Uh, and also, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, you call him noodle arm, you call whatever other BS that you guys throw out there about Bridgewater. It's just garbage. That's the, we know it's time to log off when that stuff comes out. It's just garbage. Everybody knows exactly where that team was headed with Teddy Bridgewater. Any, any other retelling of that? is you probably didn't like the draft pick on draft night and hated on the guy the whole time and uh, probably spent the entire 2015 season arguing with your friends instead of watching the team emerge as a really impressive budding team that was in route to being a Super Bowl contender. That's the, the, the only reality that exists with Teddy Bridgewater as a Viking is that's where that bus was headed because it got there with worse quarterback play. And Bridgewater managed the game in 2015 as his head coach wanted him to do. And as the receivers called upon him to do, they did not have yet Adam Thielen as he became. They did not have yet Stefan Diggs as he became. They centered the offense on Adrian Peterson because Norv Turner was Emmett Smith's coach. Like, come on, man. Uh, of course, and, and no one thinks this. No one thinks Teddy Bridgewater was a transcendent talent. No one thinks that. Whoever said that? No one thinks that. But the point when you draft a quarterback, yeah, you want to find Dan Marino. But the point is to try to compete for a Super Bowl as a franchise. And they were on their way there. And not only that, but he was an ascending player with unique leadership capabilities. And to not to to make your judgments on him based on two the first two seasons where they were rebuilding that team, I I just don't get it. He did exactly what he was asked to do in 2015, won a ton of games. I just I don't I don't know. Silliness, just silliness. That's a, it's not worse than someone who compared Kirk to Fran Tarkenton, but it's it's not it's not a good retelling. It's not a good retelling to just be like his arm wasn't strong enough. Okay, uh, every quarterback does not have to be Josh Allen in order to succeed with their team. And and the and the freaks who obsess over Brock Purdy and whether his arm was strong enough, I don't care. The Vikings franchise has not been to the Super Bowl since the 70s. Give me noodle arm or whatever analyst, draft analyst tells me a guy's arm isn't strong enough and a trip to the Super Bowl into overtime with the Chiefs. Give me that all freaking day. I don't really care about the, you know, talking about analyzing somebody's raw tools from seven years ago or whatever, uh, when we know where the franchise was headed. It was a great draft pick for them. It was the perfect, uh, you know, combination between he and Mike Zimmer. And 
There's lots of quarterbacks over the years who have won a lot of games who did not throw the ball 100 miles an hour. And and to not even get a third year out of him, that's when you usually find out about these quarterbacks. And that's when we were set to start finding out about these quarterbacks. I mean, you know, it, Drew Brees is brought up. Yeah, I mean, he's not necessarily Drew Brees or Phillip Rivers or whatever, but good enough, good enough to win, good enough to continue to improve. We saw, and it's, I'm just not going to go over it forever, but look, I got the job covering the Vikings for 1500 ESPN in 2016 in August. So guess what? The first thing I did was I hadn't moved here yet. I watched every preseason game and Mike Zimmer back in the day was playing Teddy Bridgewater. And I was watching that thinking this, this arm is looking live. Go back and look at the game against San Diego. Go back and look at some of the throws that were made there. Quarterbacks improve. He was drafted very young. And we're talking about like Bo Nix or something. The guy's 24. Teddy was 21. It it doesn't matter. It didn't work out that way. Unfortunately for you guys, knees in Minnesota just don't work together well, as we've seen even from the Timberwolves and Carl Anthony Towns. I just don't, as, as, as an obsessive over fact and over like framing things the right way, just focusing on whether he had the strongest arm in the league and not the context of where the franchise was. It's the best position the franchise has been in or had been in in a long time leading up to it. And it's it's the position you hope you get into now. If they draft J.J. McCarthy and uh, he doesn't have the perfect deep ball or something, I will let the internet yell at each other over whether he's good or not as long as this team wins. That's That's what I'm here to cover. Not arguments over whether, you know, a guy can throw the ball 70 yards in the air or not. You can draft Joe Milton if you want that. Uh, anyway, uh, Taylor wants uh, DJ reader. Great player. Yeah, I agree with that. So I'm not uh, going to spend the, the rest of, of the night um, arguing about it, but uh, I do think it's, it's instructive. That's why I like to bring it up. It's, it's instructive. It's exactly what we were talking about earlier. If you draft a quarterback and he is good enough, to be a, a winner within the context of your team, it doesn't have to be the perfect guy. So what are the odds it works out? It's much closer to a coin flip than it is. Like, of course, the transcendent thing is hard to find, but uh, can you find enough to win? That's what their goal is. So anyway, well, a lot, lot happened here, as it always does on these live streams. You guys are the best. Love all of the, the questions, the comments, uh, $137 million of cap space next year. Uh, this won't be the only free agency that you guys get where the first couple of days are absolute fire on purple insider to talk about. So, uh, it's been a really fun couple of days. I'll be on top of whatever happens. Purpleinsider.com. subscribe, you know, subscribe to this channel and so forth. We've gained a lot of followers over the last uh, handful of days, naturally, because of the excitement around this team. So I just can't wait. And guess what? For those Manny Hill fans, Thursday night, Manny Hill will be back to give his take on where the Vikings are going to go. So I know you guys have been waiting for that. Manny's going to be back. He's the best. So thanks, everybody. Once again, as always, love the participation. Really appreciate the discussion. And we will talk to you soon. Uh, tomorrow morning, by the way, conversation with uh, Chris Trapasso drops on the channel. Great discussion about Hunter leaving and, and much more. So take care, everybody. We'll see you very soon. Say it. Football.